The question of this is, do you need a local church? Uh, so the local church is the focal point of what God does in the earth. And, you know, it's a really strange day. Uh, the Internet is good and bad. The Internet's good because, you know, it can be a vehicle. You can get information out to lots of people that, that you never could minister to. The negative part of it is you expect everybody to do the same thing exactly the same way. And when you have expectations that are gained from watching somebody somewhere else in another venue doing something, it can mess your head up. Yes or no? So I want to talk about the local church and the community, what it is, what it isn't, why it exists. And I probably won't get done tonight. In fact, I've given the Lord permission to, you know, detour me the way he does at times. So uh, we're going to go there. I want to start with uh, Jesus' vision statement for the church. We have called this the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to then the disciples. This was at the ascension. Just before he went to heaven, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. So what Jesus did, he didn't keep uh, the spoils of war and uh, his resurrection power to himself. He gave it to us. Is that good news? So he immediately said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them. Everybody say teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And when he said make disciples of all nations, you know, teaching was quite different in the first century than it is now instead of just didactic teaching. You know, you listen to someone expound like you hear me do. They actually had a teacher they followed, and they watched everything that person did. Um, you know, Paul sat, for instance, at the feet of Gamaliel, who's one of the top teachers of his day, and they imbibed who that person was. Uh, their habits, their characteristics, even sometimes their mannerisms. And see, that gave weight to what the person said. So it wasn't just words, it was lifestyle. So when Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, he wasn't saying, get them saved, don't come in some water and let them go. No, he said, he said, put them under your wing and help them, right? And that's the whole reason the local church exists uh, baptizing them, he said, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So uh, the idea of the church is not a man thing. It's a God thing. It's a Jesus thing. Um, in Matthew 16, I want to read this and make some comments. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, he said to them, but who do you say I am? And the Holy Spirit came on Peter. And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So he acknowledged that the Holy Spirit came on Peter and had him have him say these words, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus capitalized on what came out of his mouth. And, uh, and I also t say that you are, are, are Petros. He said, Peter, you're a little, you're, you're a little pebble. You are a little pebble. Or, or you're a chip off the old block. You're a, you're a Petros. And on this rock, and what Jesus just said, the, the Greek word for rock is Petra, which is a, a huge rock that is stationary and you can't budge it. And uh, he said, Peter, you're a little rock, but there's just a big old something come out your mouth. And he said, um, uh, where am I? Oh, yeah. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So this confession, you are Christ, the son of the living God, that brings a person into the family of God. Now, the Catholics, for instance, and I'm not picking on Catholics, and yes, there's some great Catholics, and yes, there are Catholics that are born again. But let me just say that uh, G Jesus never meant for Peter to be the first pope. That's tough to say. I, I get that. That's not what Jesus was saying. Some people would slaughter me for saying that. I understand that. But that is not what Jesus meant there. He was getting a point across that, that something happens 
when you dedicate yourself to Jesus, there's, the, there's a big thing, when it, that thing that came out of, of Peter's mouth. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. When God gives you that personal revelation and you bow your knee to Jesus, life changes in a, in a tremendous way. How many hear me? And it's not just saying a prayer. It's giving your whole life to someone. Again, Jesus told his disciples, make disciples of all nations. So it's not, and, and here's where we messed up in America. You know, we've got this thing where we say a prayer and then keep living the way we did. That's not it. No, there's repentance and faith. Repentance precedes faith. Yes or no? Repentance means I'm done with living the way I'm living. I've got a revelation that my life is a mess. I've got a revelation that Jesus is a supernatural person and can do supernatural things in me. And, and Jesus come and I give my messed up, torn up, uh, ridiculous, crazy life. I lay it at your feet. Do something with it. And, and, and that's what, what came out of Peter's mouth. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And when you do that in your personal life, how many know life? God transforms your life. And then his plan is that we become disciples. And, you know, let me just yeah, go into the weeds a minute here. Jesus had a parable of the wheat and the tares. And uh, the wheat and the weeds, you could say, in our vernacular. And uh, he said, let them all both grow together. So we have true and false believers in the church today all over the world, particularly in America. There's a lot of people that say they're believers, but they never act like they are believers. If you're a believer in name only, you're probably not a believer. And see, that cuts across the grain a little bit, but it needs to be said because there is a commitment to Jesus that changes how you live your life and you become a disciple of his. How many hear me? And see, that's what the local church is all about. And that's why it's so important. What, what Peter said is so important to understand. And he said, um, uh, you are Peter on this rock. I'll build my church. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. Then Ephesians chapter 4, take a little bit of time here. The apostle Paul um, uh, gets really practical in Ephesians 4. He talks about who we are in Christ, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, talks about our position before God in Christ. And, and then Ephesians 4, it breaks it down in practicality and said, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each, each other. And I love this next phrase, making allowance for each other. Others' faults because of your love. Isn't that good? Colossians 3 uh, in New Living Translation says a similar thing. We're to make allowances. They see every time I read it, do I make an allowance for you? Do you make allowance for people that mess up and don't do it right, don't say it right, don't acknowledge you, don't acknowledge you when you go out of the way to serve, do something special, uh, and you're not recognized, maybe somebody else is, but you're not, do you pout, do you feel bad? You got to make allowance, Right? And then, and then some people just don't always do everything right. And uh, sometimes we get tired and get in the flesh. Have you ever gotten tired and get in the flesh? So he said, make allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Uh, um, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, the King James says, unity is necessary for the Holy Spirit to manifest. Uh, yes or no? In a nation, it, there's, if a nation's going to stay together, it, it's got to have unity. Uh, without it, it breaks apart. And a church is the same way, a marriage and family. There's got to be unity. And so he says again, um, keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there's one body, one spirit, just as he's talking about body, the body of Christ, and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future, there is one Lord, that's Jesus, one faith to be saved, one baptism. Now, he's talking about here being placed into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Immersion into, the word baptized means to immerse in. He's not necessarily talking about baptism in water. He's talking about the Lord placing you into the body of Christ by virtue of being born again. You're placed in two. So when somebody, we had a baptism service last week, what happened? We immerse people in water. And it was an outward symbol of, of, of the baptism into the body of Christ the person had already experienced. But that's what he's, that's what he's saying here. Um, uh, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Then he says, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, however, 
uh, he begins to emphasize he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. So um, every believer is expected to be used by Jesus in his family to help other people. So see, that, that makes me ask myself a question. Am I allowing God to use me to help other people? Uh, and then if God's planted me in a church, a local church, we'll go in there in a minute, uh, am, am, I being, am I allowing God to use me in that church to help other people? If I'm not, then it may be that I'm not fulfilling everything the Lord wants of me. Yes or no? So he goes on to say, however, he's given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. And again, let me give a little plug for Growth Track. We have our four meetings on Sundays, uh, first, second, third, and fourth Sunday. And there you can find out the gifting. We have a spiritual gifts test. If you haven't taken that, go to our Growth class, growth classes, and uh, third class, I think, or I think that's the one. I, somebody have to holler at me with that one. Is it still third one? Second one. Okay, they've changed it. Uh, you know, you could take a test, a spiritual gifts test, and it's just uh, seventy-two multiple choice. Just, I mean, I mean, the teacher just rattles them off, and you got to click, check, check, check. Cause it's supposed to come from your heart. Don't analyze it a lot. And if you'll do it, it'll show you what your what your yearnings are inside. Whatever God's called you to do, you'll have a desire for it inside. Delight yourself in the Lord, Psalm 37, 4, and he will give you or place into you a one way to interpret it. He'll give you the desires of your heart. You know, God will bless you with things you like or if you delight yourself in him, he places his desires in you. That's, I'm here because I was just following the inward desire. If you'll follow the inward desire on the inside, God's put a desire in you to do something. Uh, that g- class, again, can help you find out what that is. There's nobody not called in the body of Christ to do something, right? Right? So, again, um, each one of us has a pe- special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the Scriptures say, so let me say about the growth classes, every Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, you can head down first door on the right in the children's ministry wing, and you can take that test second class, and we also do a personality uh uh, test and it just helps find out where you fit because when you're the right place at the right time with the right fit it just is a blessing and verse 8 says that is why the scriptures say when he ascended to the heights he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people now that it is said he ascended this clearly means christ also descended to our lowly world and the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with with himself. Jesus is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and he has the glory he had had before he came and became a man. It came back on him when he came to heaven, and he helps the Father rule the universe. Hebrews 11, 3 says, the worlds were framed by his word, and he upholds, Colossians 1 says, he upholds all things by the power of his word. What a person. And he's, your, and, and he's your Savior, and he's the one that loves you immensely. And thank God for a good roof that doesn't leak. And so he says, and the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts. I could talk real loud, so y'all listen. Nineteen ninety three, January of nineteen ninety three, we had uh, you could call it several things: a gully washer, a Noah flood, a Noah's flood in South Carolina. I was preaching on Sunday morning; it was so loud you couldn't hear me speak, and I just had to quit until the rain because they didn't have any insulation on the roof. Ridiculous, but anyway, my mind goes everywhere sometimes when I hear things. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Here are five of them. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. So these are five ministry offices that that Jesus places in the church. And these are, are special endowments from the Holy Spirit. This isn't taught on much these days, but in the 70s and 80s when I was cutting my spiritual teeth, there was a lot of teaching on the ministry offices that Jesus placed in the church. And there was a real emphasis on the call of God. And I remember, and this is something that we don't do, and we ought to get back to it. When I was a little boy, I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church. You know, every Sunday, 
I remember the pastor saying, after he gave an altar call, he said, if you feel called of God into full-time Christian service, come down. I'll never forget that. I thought, wow, that's a pretty big deal. Why is he doing that? And every once in a while, we'd have somebody wander down front. And there are people that I know in ministry today because they answered the call. I was called uh, 18 and a half years of age, six months after I gave my life to Jesus. That call is very real. So the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, those are ministry offices and there is a distinct there is a distinct anointing from the Holy Spirit to fulfill that kind of ministry. That's not talked about a lot today. What I want you to realize is this is not a person a person that just says, I want to be an apostle, I think I'll be a prophet, or I think I'll be a teacher. This is not somebody that's skilled because they've been to school or college. Nothing wrong with school or college. I've been to three colleges, but the issue is there has to be an anointing. And without the anointing, you can't stand in that office. The challenge we're having in the church today is there's some people that are standing in these offices without an anointing. And if you try to stand in an office you're not anointed to be in, you're going to have problems. Yes or no? So see, you don't get all that from the internet. You see a lot of zip, zam, zowie, and a lot of stuff. But there is a, defi- there is a divine call, and then there's an anointing. And then the issue here. Uh, I like the way King James, this is New Living, I think. This one's about to fall apart, but here we are. Uh, The King James says, and he himself, verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Uh, Jesus himself calls the people that are in these, these ministry offices, and there is a distinct anointing for each one of these. I don't have time to talk about the apostle which is a sent one, nor yet the prophet, um, uh, which, is, which makes the, the unseen very real. The evangelists, they are the ones that have a passion to, to, to get people born again, sometimes in mass, uh, such a needed, necessary ministry. And then there are uh, the pastors and teachers. Weiss translation says it. This way, pastors who were also teachers, some go so far as to say there is, there is no such thing as being a pastor without being a teacher. In fact, First Peter 5, Peter said, shepherd, feed. The King James says, feed the flock of God. Other translations, modern say, say uh, shepherd the flock of God. Well, the whole idea behind a shepherd is, is taking care of the nourishment of the sheep. And that's what a pastor is called to do. So perhaps Wiest is right when he says pastors who are also teachers. And let me, me, I I feel compelled here to to stop and and share something. And if I don't get done, I'll get it next time. That means two weeks from now. But I I need to say, these are are anointings from the Holy Spirit. You know, when I was a young man, I had, I I was in Bible, second Bible school that I attended. Susan came with me and uh, I was saying, God, I, and there was just something beating, beating away on the inside of me. And I said, God, what in the world do you want me to do? I know I'm called into ministry. I mean, I had such a, a supernatural call in February of 1975. And some of you have heard this, but I haven't shared this in a long, long time. I worked in a grocery store while I went to college. I was going to be an electronics engineer. And, um, and then I was taking Bible school classes at night as well. And, uh, and I was working on a gondola, which is the, uh, in a grocery store, in the end cap where you put product, you know, and I was putting the product on the end shelf. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I heard, I heard, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher. I looked around, what the, what's that? And I heard it all afternoon. I got off at 6 o'clock. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the priest. So I'm doing my little work, you know, and, uh, but the whole time. I mean, over and over again. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher. I said, this is the most outlandish thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, I'm a sm- pot-smoking hippie boy. What is this? Vanity of vanity, and I got saved, of course. But I'm just saying, what is this? And I went home, and my mother, we didn't have a microwave yet, so she heated my my supper up in a little oven on the, on the, on the counter. And by the, when I got home, she put it in front of me. I said, Mom, I got to ask you a question. What's vanity of vanities? All is vanity. Where's that? She said, all bit bits. That's from Ecclesiastes. I said, Ecclesiastes? says, yeah. I went to my bedroom, shut the door, and read all 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes. 
And you know what? God used that one phrase to call me in the ministry because my one ambition was to make money. I wanted to be the best that I could be at whatever I was doing. I had opportunities, and I'll have time to get into all the details to do, other, to do some things. But I just wanted to, I wanted to be a businessman. I wanted to make money, and I wanted to provide for my family. And I always worked really hard. I've always excelled because I work hard. And I just wanted that. And when God said this, he was telling me, everything you're wanting to do is empty unless you do what I want you to do. And I want you to preach for me. So, so you know, uh, 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 I said all that to say the divine call is supernatural. It's not natural. And it's extremely personal. And if you're called of God, you'll know it. And if you're called of God in the ministry, you can never, ever be satisfied doing anything else, ever. Um, I started my first church in 1988, turned it over to someone in 1990, went into a traveling ministry. And while I had the traveling ministry, you've heard my story, uh, I augmented my income by starting a paint and wallpaper paper contracting business during the week, ended up hiring a bunch of people to do that. But you know, the whole time I was doing that, there's something eking away on the inside of me. Nothing was satisfying to me. And I, I was 32 years old when I started that uh, contracting business. And that was a telltale sign to me. I don't care how much money I made. I don't care how busy we were during the week. And I'd preach on the weekends, you know, not as much as I was wanting to. It's, you know, because it, it wasn't my call to be a traveling minister. But, um, but I, it just sealed the deal for me that I know that I know that I know that I'm called into full-time ministry because there's something itching away, eking away at me, and I can never, ever get away from it. People that are mentors of mine in the Lord say, if you're a cow, you've got to you gotta move. If you're a rooster, you've got to crow. If you're a dog, you've got to bark. And if you're called into ministry, you've got to minister in that vein God's called you to. How many hear me? So I was in Bible school, and uh, uh, probably one of the smartest men I've, I've, ever, I've ever met, he, was, uh, he had a, uh, in that, we were in Oklahoma, and uh, we had a class on faith, and he was mentioning Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And, and I was second Bible school, Susan's with me, and I'm saying, God, I know I'm called, but what am I called specifically to do? What, what is it? And, and that's, that class, he, he solidified it for me. He's, he just stopped one day and said, what do you want to do? I mean, what's the biggest desire in your heart? What do you want to do? And, that, and everybody got really quiet, and I did too. I thought, wow, what, what do I want to do? And, and you know, it, it, something rose up inside me. I just want to help people. Know who they are in Jesus. And y'all, that's when the teacher, see, I have two of these offices in Ephesians 4.11 are working in my life. First one was teacher. And that's a supernatural gift. You know, you can go to a college, university, you can learn all the teaching skills and, and, you know, the correct way to do it. There's one thing to teach from a piece of paper, but there's another, there's another thing entirely when you teach in the Holy Spirit oozes out from inside of you and smothers your words so when people hear them, it affects them on the inside. Did you hear what I'm saying? Now that, my friends, is a supernatural gift. And, you know, God placed that gift in me and, and, uh, and I found myself over and over again just, I didn't mean to do it, but I'd find myself talking to this person, that person, this person, that person, and... Uh, and, and I'd end up have, having a little teaching session with them. And, and then later on, you know, ministry formed and, you know, I started ministering like I do now. But that teaching gift was there. So, so I said all that to say, what is inside of you? Some of you, your passion is to help children. Other people, you love to work with numbers. Other people have a technical side to them and they just love to make technical things work. And I, you can expound on that all you want. I'm just saying whatever. Uh, others just love to serve people, love to make sure things are organized and in their place. See, see, whatever God's got for you, it's already on the inside of you. How many hear what I'm saying? It's inside. And what you'll find out, if you'll just be faithful in whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. That's what the book of Proverbs says. The hand of the diligent is, is the hand that will find where it belongs and. And uh, so again, you, you usually don't start in ministry where God's called you, 
But if you're faithful in one place, you'll be faithful in another. If you can't be, be faithful over that which is another man's, how can you be faithful in that which is your own? How many hear me? So some people never, see, see Romans, one, many are called, Paul said, but few are chosen. Many are called, but not as many as are called are actually chosen by God to do things. Why? Because not everybody will, will give the things necessary to find out what they're called to do. One of the first characteristics of being called of God, if you want to find out, is you have to be willing to do something. You've got to be willing to make yourself uncomfortable and do what you don't like. Did you know I started ministry? I won't even get to my notes. I'm done now. This is it. I got one other thing. Uh, I started ministry setting chairs down in a large local church in Oklahoma. Do you know that? Uh, twice a week, 1,200 chairs. They had to be take, taken up and put down twice every week because we had a school. And I got, and, and I didn't like doing that. It was aggravating, made my back hurt, you know. It was, you know, I, I worked at night, so I got up in midway of my sleep because I, well, I had to get up at 8 o'clock. At night. But I would get up just to go help them, uh, put the chairs up and down at church on Sundays and Wednesdays for the services. And, and, um, and, and you know, if I hadn't have done that, I don't think I'd be here today. I, I didn't like to do that. I started ministry as a janitor, so, uh, you know, mopping floors. I had a phrase, which ain't a nice phrase. We had big bathrooms. I called them God's nasty people because I had to clean the bathrooms, you know. But you know, if I hadn't been willing to swab the toilets and clean the sinks, empty the trash, and mess with everybody else's junk and mess and nasty, and just wipe their nose on the mirror, oh, my Lord. You know, if I hadn't been willing to do that, I wouldn't be here today. So you got to be willing to put yourself out. And God's looking for people. So how about you? What are you willing to do? If all you do is sit and say, well, I'm available if you want me to use, if you want to use me, he'll never use you. He will never use you. If you wait, he will never use you. There's one thing required in stewards, 1 Corinthians 4. It's that a man be found faithful or a woman, proving himself, amplified says, worthy of trust. If you can't do the small thing, you'll never do the larger thing. Let me give you another story. So God called me as a teacher first. Secondly, listen to this story. Um, I started a church and, and the pastoral anointing came on me, but it was uh, augmented in 1993. And before I came here, I've been here since October of 94. Some of you know that, not everybody. Some of you were there in the early years. But before I came here, uh, I became associate pastor of a church in my hometown on a part-time basis in 1992 while I traveled in ministry and, um, and, and, and then had a business going and I had to keep it going and it was growing. So I was really busy. I worked part of my time. I think I worked 16 hours a week for the church as associate pastor and then I had to keep my business going and running and I would do the estimates and you know get things set up and go buy the materials and, and, and set up the workers and tell them where to do and what to do and talk to the homeowners and all that. And, uh, and I was just really busy, and Susan and I have four kids. Good Lord Jesus, help us. I see, see somebody running through the door and figured out it was me. I'm just seeing myself running back and forth, just running all the time. But, um, but 1993, uh, September of 92, I uh, went to lunch with a pastor. He had gone to Latvia uh, on a short-term missions trip. And uh, he, then after that, his wife came to me and said, something's wrong, his name was Carl. Some of you have heard this story. She said, <clears throat> Mitch, you need to pray for her. And I was, again, part-time associate pastor. Mitch, you need to pray for Carl. Something's wrong with him. I was like, well, I've been knowing that a long time. I was joking. <laughs> What's wrong with him? I said, well, I said, um, he's just not normal. I said, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> None of us are. I know you don't understand. He's not like he was before he went on that trip. I said, what do you mean? He's just ill at ease. Is there something up with him? I don't know what it is. He's never been this way. Something's wrong. I said, okay. The uh, other thing that happened, uh, that whole summer of 1992, I would preach like on Sunday. We had Sunday night services. I'd preach on Sunday nights and, and uh, different times, Wednesday night, sometimes Sunday morning. And, uh, but anyway, I would have dreams and, and I would see myself preaching in his pulpit and I'm pastoring his church. And I'm thinking, I'm just full of pride. Something's wrong with me. And I say, God, you just got to forgive me. Help me. I'm having this thing all over again. What's wrong with me? Having this dream over and over. He sat me down in September of 1992 uh, and took me to a nice uh, 
Mexican restaurant. And I like Mexican food. We finished our food, you know. He said, <coughs> Mitch, I got something to tell you. I said, okay, what is that, Doc? He said, I'm leaving and taking my whole family to Latvia January next year. That's January of 1993. I'm leaving the second Sunday in January. And guess what? I want you to pastor my church for me. Well, after I tried to pick my jaw up off the floor, huh, wah, 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 huh? You know, you want me to pastor your church? Yep, I want you to pastor my church for me. And so um, I got to wind this story up and make it shorter. I, um, uh, so I said, okay. And then, of course, you know, I had to go full-time, give them a business, uh, let somebody else run the business for me. I didn't have time. And uh, so I did it. So the second Sunday of January came was the last Sunday he was in the church telling the story for a reason. I'm talking about the anointing to fulfill a ministry office and how it comes. Um, so that Sunday morning, you know, it's a different day than it is today. We all had our suit, coats, and ties on, all that. And I'm sitting in a wingback chair in front of his desk in his office. Uh, the musicians are playing. It's a few minutes before 10 o'clock. They only had one Sunday morning service. It wasn't a large church, but it was a significant church. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and, and the pastor, you know, he's uh, in his chair, his leather chair behind his nice desk, and I'm in the wingback chair in front. And he said, now, Mitch, and he was a little melodramatic. Now, Mitch, I'm, I'm going, this is my last Sunday with the people. I said, yes, sir, yes, there it is. And it's just the way he did it. He looked down a little bit, and then he, um, he cut his eyes at me and said, Mitch, I got one thing to tell you. You know, it, it felt like I was in the principal's office, about to get chewed on a minute. He looked at me and said, Mitch, I got one thing to say. I said, okay, all right. I was kind of getting ready, bracing. What is it? And you know what he said? Mitch, love my people. Now let me tell you where my mind went. Six, seven months prior, I can't go anywhere with this part of the story just to tell you what happened. I'm in my office six or seven months prior to that. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to say what happened. I was casting a demon spirit out of a woman in my office. She had been addicted to crack cocaine and was selling it. And uh, long short of it was a demon spirit manifested. I don't even have, I've told the story before. Uh, and when it manifested, man, I come smooth over that desk, grabbed her head in my hands. I said, come out, you unclean spirit. Come out, come out. While I'm saying come out, you know, it's trying to manifest and then Call, the pastor's in the office with me, and, uh, you know, he's got all of his nicey-nice stuff on. And I said, son, help me hold her down. Help me hold her down. She's trying to get away from me. And that devil looked at him and said, I hate you. I hate you. You act too much like Jesus. And I looked at that woman who the devil was in and said, well, devil, at least you told the truth on that. You're exactly right, because... Carl had an ability to love people that was uncanny, uncanny. Does that make sense? Now, I'll just leave that right there because there's a whole lot. So I'll come right back to seven months later. I'm in his office, and when he said, Mitch, love my people, I said, okay. And he said it two or three times, Mitch, I want you to hear me. I know you. Now, Susan told me uh, when I was young, said, Mitch, you know, if you'd have been in the, in the armed services, you could have been a dr good drill sergeant. <laughs> That's not a great thing for your wife to tell you. It's kind of an undercut. But that's what she said. I see, so that came to my mind when he said that. And he said, look, I know you. And, you know, I could chew on you pretty quickly. If you were out of line, I could chew on you pretty good. And he said again, Mitch, love my people. I said, I will. And then 10 o'clock came. They start singing. He said, one more thing. He ran around his desk. He had a, and he, uh, he just did things I wouldn't do. He had, it looked, like a, it looked like a judge's robe hanging on the back. I think he got it from the denomination he was raised in. He had a judge, it looked like a judge's robe, ministry robe, you know, black, hanging on his door. He said, watch this. He got that robe. He threw that thing around here and zipped it up. I said, what you do? You go preach your last sermon in a dang robe? Are you kidding me? He said, you'll see, you'll see. We come out and we come out the door. I, I was on the front row with Susan and uh, 
he gets up, you know, and we, he got up there. Everybody's looking up. He is cuckoo today. He's got a robe on. Look at this. You, got to, you come to judge. What is he doing? So, you know, we finish praise and worship. He preaches the whole sermon. Last message to his people in a robe. And people looking at him like, you just crazy. You are crazy. You've lost your marble, son. What are you doing? And at the very end of his message, he said, Mitch, come here. Everybody stand up, make a perimeter circle all the way around the building. They said, everybody, make a circle, one big, and so everybody made a big old circle. A lot of people there, that one big old circle, side by side, you know. He said, Mitch, come here. I got Rue, got right in the middle. And he said, you know, this is uh, my last time with you for a whole year. He was going to establish a church in Leopaya, Latvia, which is on the Baltic Sea. And he said, I'm going to be gone for a year. And God's called this man right here, pointed at me, to take my place and to be in my stead as your pastor. And all I could think about, love my people, okay, love my people. He said, and you know what? The anointing to do it is coming on him right now. When he said that, he zipped that robe off and threw it on me and zipped it up on me. And there wasn't a dry eye in the crowd, including mine. And y'all, something happened to me. I, I just have to tell you. Susan, you remember Susan? Something happened to me. My kids were little. Something happened to me. So he left. When we took him to the airport, he's gone. And so I'm pastoring for him that whole year, that whole year. And here's somebody, you know, they're sitting in front of my desk and they're pouring out their heart telling me all their problems. And while they're talking, I'm thinking, I know exactly what to say to this person. I'm going to set them straight right now, right now. I know exactly what they need to hear. I'll be daddy talking to them. And I heard his voice, Mitch, love my people. And instead of being harsh, I wasn't. I listened, and I loved them. I'd be on the phone with somebody. And, I, you know, you just ever got aggravated with somebody and just said, I'm tired of hearing you? Well, I ha you don't know how many times this happened. Everything I'm saying happened multiple times. I'm talking on the phone with somebody. I said, how many times have they been through this rigmarole with me? I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to tell it just like it is right now. And when I said that, I thought that in my mind. I heard his voice. Mitch loved my people. So, and then I'd be up in the pulpit. Say, you know what? We're going to share the sheep today. We're going we're gonna to show them how it is. And I was just about to say something. And I would hear his voice. Mitch, love my people. Y'all, when that happens to you for a whole year, something happens inside. And uh, then when I came here, God gave me Luke 16. If you can't be faithful over that which is another man's, how can you have that which is your own? I had to be faithful over his sheep. They weren't mine. And I, and, and I hold a lot to that story. I just wanted to tell you that. But, but something happened inside me. The harshness. I'm not always that. Sometimes it comes back on me and that I get in that, uh, you know, in that mode where I can be the drill sergeant. But not often. Not like it used to be. Something happened. There's an anointing to pastor. How many hear what I'm saying? There's a love that you have for people. There's a belief in a person that's not doing it right that comes in a pastor's life. It's a shepherd. A shepherd, a true shepherd, will see the best in you. Do you hear what I'm saying? So that's why every believer needs a local church with a God-anointed pastor because that pastor can see through the flesh and see the real you, and love you when you're a mess. Did you hear me? And it's an anointing from the Holy Spirit. So when I think of that pastor's anointing, my mind always goes back to that, because that was a viable time in my life when it changed a part of my personality that was just a bit twisted. I think it takes a twisted person to be a drill sergeant. I don't know. Maybe some of y'all can tell. <laughs> I'm picking now. Let me finish. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, watch this. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in the faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. What is the responsibility of the ministry offices? Here it is. Uh, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. They don't do the work. 
And for years, the church thought that the pastor was to do all the work. So most pastors are ultimately worn out and tired because everybody thinks that they need to preach the sermon, straighten up the auditorium before the preaching. Uh, you know, they need to mop the floor, make sure the bathrooms are right, weed eat the front yard so it looks nice before everybody comes in. And then they need to go see everybody at the hospital. And they need to go visit everybody in the house. When, and whenever they have a problem, they need to come around it. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work. They don't do all the work. They equip others to do the work. That's the job of the pastor. Yes or no? And build up the church, the body of Christ. How long does it continue until we all come into such unity? in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be a mature, mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we'll no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. My friends, we're living in a culture right now that it's a bunch of mess. And that's why you need God-called, God-anointed people in these offices of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and we need the local church. It's an incubator. It's a disciple maker. It's like an incubator in a, in a hospital where the, the, the premature baby goes and he's, he's in the incubator and they're, they're, you know, they're bringing him to life and they're bringing him to the point that he can make it on his own. And that's what the local church is for. It's to build up the body of believers so that we can go out and affect our world. This is a filling station. This is a place where we go get filled up, yes or no? And so he goes on to say, instead, we will speak the truth and love growing up in every way more, to be more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I don't have time to go any further today, except I do want to say this. Um, you know, there's a devaluing. There has been because of COVID and because of churches shutting down and, and because of fear that the propagandists have placed in people's minds in a large way. There's a huge fear. Even, and, and, and listen, I talk to pastor friends all over the nation, and everybody's dealing with the same thing. Uh, people aren't coming to church the way they were. Yes or no? Now, if you're watching online, I'm glad you're online, but I want to challenge you. There is nothing that can take the place of you being together with a body of believers in an assembly together. There is nothing that can take that place. Let me further say, and I'll two weeks from now we'll get back into the thick of this you can never grow spiritually alone the monk in a cave <laughs> during the during during the uh, you know middle ages you know you're not going you know you think you're growing no you grow among relationships you grow in the rub you grow when god places you with people that aren't quite like you and he's calling you to love them just the way they are and not try to change them. That's the local church. <laughs> you, you grow where, where, where God plants you in a place that other people are different than you, have other skill sets than you, and you learn, learn not to teach your horn so loudly that they, they, they can't hear anything but you. You learn to work in sync with everybody else. Yes or no? And our world desperately needs the local church. And you know what? Today, in the environment that we're in, in the harsh climate that we're in worldwide, just before Jesus comes back, God wants the church to come back together. He wants it to unify. He wants every believer to be a, a, a solid person attending a local church. Yes or no? It's the will of God. Lastly, I'll say this. When I was a boy, um, one thing that saved my hide, uh, I was in drugs, smoking pot, doing all kinds of things with it as a teenager, but one thing that saved my eyes is from, from the time I was a little boy, one thing my parents did instill in me was a reverence and respect for church. I'm not seeing that today, the way I saw it as a, as a child in my own life. I went to church Sunday mornings, Sunday nights. I went to the believers' meetings. I know we're not, I know this isn't the church. I know we're the church. You know what I'm saying. But I went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, come what may, when I felt good, when I didn't feel good, when I had homework, I did it right there in the pew on Wednesday night. I mean, it's just, just the way it was. My grandmama, I had aunts and uncles that would come. My grandmama would just show up on Sunday morning. I had an uncle that would just show up at my house on Sunday morning. And you know what? My daddy, uh, he smelled like Aquavelva. He was the Aquavelva man. 
And uh, my mama had her all her lipstick on. She was ready to go, had her pretty dress on, and I had my little tie on. And uh, my, my grandmama would drive up, my aunts and uncles drive up. So I'm glad y'all at their house today. Look, we're just going to church. Come and go with us. They weren't dressed because they were on the way to the beach, but they wanted to eat lunch. And she said, well, have you some iced tea? We'll be back when church is over. But we went to church. You know what that did to me? That told me there's nothing more important than church. Not even grandmama. Not even my aunt, my uncle. Something's up with this. What is going on? Even when it didn't feel good, get your butt, son. Let's go. We're going to go to church. God will heal you on the way. Let's go. Got homework? God will help you do the homework. You'll do it better at church. Let's go. That taught me something. So when I, I came of age and, and the devil got <laughs> grabbed me by the nap of the neck, tried to rule my life, there's something in me. So, you know, I need to go back. I need to go back. You know, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. I want to encourage you. If you're a parent, grandparent, get your kids, get your grandkids in church. It says something. It's not convenient. It's aggravating. But the local church, this is an incubator. This is a place where you can grow. This is a place where you can develop. And Jesus is still developing the church today. And it needs to be developed more now than ever because we've got a big job to do. Yes or no? Stand up on your feet or I won't quit talking. <laughs> Y'all get something out of that? Yes. Come on. Come on, lift your hands to the Lord right now. Lord, all of us, Lord, if we're in the family of God, there may be people in the room, you're not in the family of God yet. You can be. You can be. But Lord, I, I just pray for all of us. Lord, help us to find our place. There's not a lot of time left, it seems, just before Jesus returns. Help us to find that place. Help us to prove ourselves faithful. Help us to delight ourselves in you so you can place in us what you want us to do. Help us to fulfill your purpose, your plan. And you will not everybody's call like me, I know that. But every one of us has a place in the body of Christ. All of us have a ministry gift, a gift inside of us to do something to help someone else. And it's spawned by the Holy Spirit. And I'm asking you to let that, those gifts in every person in this room awaken in the name of Jesus. And Lord, help us to see life from your perspective. We often just see it from our vantage point. Let us to see, see it from your angle, the bird's eye view, the God's eye view. Help us to see a world in need. And you've placed something special, a treasure in us that can help someone else. Let it be in Jesus' name. You know, you may be watching online or you may be in the room and say, you know, I'm not even in the family of God. I haven't done what Peter did yet. Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. When he said that, he submitted his life to Jesus. You may be in the room or you may be watching online. You haven't submitted your life to Jesus yet. I want you to know he's calling you right now. He's calling you to forsake your stuff because you're not satisfied with where you're at, what you're doing, how you're living. It's no longer satisfying you. You're, you're going through the motions. You're doing it over and over again. And you get emptier and emptier and emptier instead of fuller and fuller. There's nobody can fill you up like Jesus can. And Jesus is calling you to forsake your life, forsake the way you've been living, <laughs> and, get, and grab a hold of him. And he'll give you a life that you didn't even know was available. It's a life of freedom. It's a life of purpose. <laughs> it's a life of peace, joy. There is no peace, Isaiah said, to the wicked. I know what it feels like to have a lack of peace. You're laying in bed and you're not at rest. You're not happy with yourself or anything else. Give your life away. You'll get it back. I want you to pray with me. Everybody in the room, close your eyes. You may be here and you know what? You need to give your life to Jesus. That means you give yourself away. That means you say, God, I'm really willing to give up all this mess I've been involved in and give my life to you. There's somebody in the room, God's calling you tonight. He's calling you to forsake what you've been, what you've been, how you've been living, and give your life away. If you don't, you're gonna have a hard, you're gonna have the worst time of your life unless you make the change. There's somebody watching, you know, that the enemy won't snuff your life out. He's tried several times. You've come close. But you know what? God's got a plan for you. He's got a plan to, to help you. Set you free. You're in the room. You're watching. You need Jesus. 
like to pray a prayer. Everybody help me. Pray it out loud with me. This means you're giving yourself away, saying, you know what? I'm done living the way I've been living. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I believe what the Bible says, that Jesus is God's Son, and that He died for my sin, for all of my wrongdoing, all of my wrong thinking, all of my wrong living, all of my wrong words. And Jesus, I ask you, forgive me for all of my sin. And cleanse my whole past. Everything I've ever done wrong, forgive me right now. Come into my life and change me from the inside out. Holy Spirit, come and live inside of me. Make me different inside. Right now, Jesus Christ, I give my life to you. And I say right now that Jesus Christ is my Lord. He rules me. I give you permission. Would you lift your hands with me? Everybody in the room, and if you just prayed that, maybe you've known the Lord, you got away, or maybe you've never have. There's a new beginning for you. Lord, thank you for the new beginning. Thank you. Let the Spirit of God work in every life. All of us, Lord, work in us in a fresh way. In Jesus' name.